Hello everyone and welcome back to my Galileo 6.4x series in Kerbal Space Program 1.2.2. In this episode we begin by trying to launch a good container and some science to another location on the surface of Gale, to another biome, so that we can do some more science. So basically we're building a ballistic missile and we want it to be cheap and fully recoverable. And so you can see here we've got parachutes on the top, uh, four pods on the side to carry extra fuel but also to help with stability when it lands so we don't have to use landing struts and so I launched it like this uh, purple was I think probably a requested color or just a whim uh, as far as the color of the tank goes and so we're just trying to toss it to another biome whatever that biome happens to be quickly get some signs so we can unlock more things and uh, basically trying to get over those mountains would be a good idea. This isn't really a ballistic missile trajectory. Normally you go to space and then come back down uh, to maximize the ground that you cover. Really, the planet is rotating under you during that time. Uh, but there's more of a cruise missile, I guess. Yeah. Um, anyway, all for science, of course. Uh, nothing malicious about it at all. And uh, once I see that our trajectory has gotten to someplace new, not really very far as far as the actual landscape of Gale is concerned, uh, these are very, and uh, a certain lack of control here, I have to say. Uh, so as long as we get far enough, I'll shut down the engine, or, okay, in this case, if I lose control, I'll shut off the engine. I was reserving some fuel just in case I needed to slow down on the way back down. Probably didn't need to, but it's always a good idea to keep some just in case. You can see, we're not going very far at all, but it's still a different biome, so that's alright. Uh, the mountains, though, the mountains are always a bit of a trick here, and uh, we seem to be coming down um, on a slope. It's definitely a slope. We got the parachutes out, but that's definitely a slope right there. It's quite challenging. It's not the worst of it. Well, okay, it's pretty bad. Look at that slope and um, I'm trying to use the thrall to help our recoverability and plop okay good and nothing blew up right there that's almost amazing frankly and uh, the ground is shaking quite a lot when we perform all science here uh, well perform science we can see it does say Gale's volcano which is an interesting biome so I guess there's a good reason for the, vol yeah, for the ground to be shaking like that because volcanoes have a lot of seismic things going on and magma underneath and but I wonder if that's just glitchiness. <laughs> so I, I don't know why it's shaking. It could be a bad thing. It could be alright because it's a volcano. Who knows? Um, I decided to try it again and wonder about the instability. You can see the center of lift is weirdly off and also non-responsive. It's on the ground so it's probably fooling me. There, it's completely symmetrical, the vehicle is, so there's no good reason for it to be over there. And we've also got those side pods that should uh, make it aerodynamically okay. The fact that it's starting off tilted here is not okay, but I decided to go anyway and proceed. The gimbling on the core engine is quite nice, the only engine on there, actually. Uh, so it does have good control, and here, for some reason, it worked better than last time. I didn't really... I, I put a nose cone on top. I guess that's the key thing. And here we go again. Uh, we will slow down a bit to make sure that our descent is gentle and that we can recover all this. Parachutes out. Can we stick the landing this time instead of tilting over? Let's find out. Uh, blah, blah. A little bit of rocking. A little bit of rocking. But it settles down and we can form science in the highlands this time. This is the highlands. So a little bit of extra science to start off the whole thing. Uh, sort of calm way to start uh, this particular play session in Galileo Plant Pack. Next we aim for loftier goals with the Vanguard 1 contract. And that requires a solar powered satellite in space and in orbit. And uh, so we recently unlocked the solar panels. I think it was with that science that we just got. Maybe we had unlocked it before, but those are tiny little solar panels from one of the USI packs. And so we just need to get a solar-powered satellite in orbit. Uh, these aren't relay antennae on this particular satellite, so it won't be able to provide communication support yet. It's just uh, going to be up there and fulfill the contract. Neither was Vanguard 1 a relay satellite anyway, so it's still the same thing. Uh-oh. 
Oh no, we had a flip. Uh, that's not a very good time to stage, frankly, but anyway, we did a single flip, but not a more complicated flip, so maybe it's salvageable. LVT-45 there, of course, for that engine, and we've got parachutes there to recover it. And then uh, this four-nozzle engine, continuing on, and here's the end of that stage. We still haven't unlocked the Terrier engine, which will simplify our staging a bit. We have to use all these stages because we don't have very good ISP. Uh, this one, this little engine is not too bad on the ISP. And then we've got these little guy, radial engines. That was mainly uh, for the service module of the capsule, uh, but I guess they're handy here too. They're not very good with the ISP though. And, oh, and these were used because we wanted to recover the probe that it is based on. That was the Discoverer 1 probe. Anyway, we got to orbit successfully despite the flip and fulfilled the Vanguard 1 contract. So the next thing was to aim a little bit higher. This is a high orbit test. You can see HO test there. And the goal was to try and fulfill those contracts uh, that were in sort of synchronous orbits around Gale. They're not really synchronous orbits around Gale. They're really high up. And so we've got a much more powerful rocket with three boosters here. And I throw down the core engine because we really don't need its thrust to weight ratio right now, but it's good to have it lit for extra stability. Uh, so this is just going to go up there and try and fulfill those contracts is the goal. We've tried to fulfill the contracts previously, but we didn't have enough Delta V. And also this does have the benefit of solar panels so it will also be a little bit less prone to running out of electric charge. Okay, and then so now this uh, LVT-45 stage running out and it's got parachutes, we will try to recover, it's not going that fast so it's less than 2,000 meters per second right now and with reference to gale velocities that's not too bad Okay, and then this added another 2,000 or so meters per second, and then we move on to the next stage. This time we remove the little inefficient engines so that uh, this can have all of the fuel, which is uh, better for the whole transfer thing. We got to orbit, and you can see an intercept plot to the desired orbit. Not exactly the apoapsis or periapsis, I think it was one of the nodes. And then we had a problem. So, this is dang it. Uh, deciding that it's time for an oxidizer fuel tank failure and so you can see the tank that has failed is lit in red and I turn off the alarm eventually a little bit too late I think uh, I was informed by my viewers that I should probably move the oxidizer to another tank instead of just let it leak out I hadn't actually thought of that uh, I I'm sad to admit, but anyway, uh, that was done, but you can see we lost a lot of oxidizer in the meanwhile, and uh, that definitely hurts our ability to get into the desired orbit. The light blue one there is the one we were aiming for, not the red one. We did get to do some science at least, that's good, performing science, but you can see I've used up the oxidizer trying to match orbits with the target orbit, but it didn't work. So, another launch, this time with four boosters, and I'm also using the Planet Shine uh, functionality to increase the ambient light a bit, though I don't want to overdo that because it does tend to mess up the colors as well. I, I don't like the whole ambient light effect. I prefer more natural lighting, but... And also I turned off the filter I was using because that darkens things a bit. Okay, here we go. So, add a Delta V thanks to four boosters. And of course we're hoping that there's no oxidizer leak this time or any other dang it fault, though uh, of course I could have salvaged that situation a little bit better last time. So here we go, end of the booster stage. Separation, no flip, no flip. And we continue safely. And everything looks spot on as we finish up the first stage here, going faster than we were last time, but that's partly because we had the extra booster. So here we go separation and ignition and on with the second stage so let's see where this uh, leaves us 
Yep, going uh, more than 4,200 meters per second after the second stage. And the third stage, final stage in this case. And on to orbit. After reaching orbit, we have the transfer there, as you can see plotted. And how much delta V do we have? Well, more than 3,000, so hopefully it'll be enough. Off we go, no uh, particular faults or issues. Just cruising right along and out to the desired orbit. Don't need to do any science on the way because we already did that with the previous attempt. And here's our attempt to circularize at the desired orbit. You can see it takes a chunk, but not more than we have. It's about 1,100. And here's us finishing that burn. I'm not gonna belabor the point since, uh, you know, if we've got the Delta V, we've got the Delta V. There's no trick to this. And the uh, contract says it's all right with the orbit, and we're just holding for 10 seconds. And fulfilled. All right, but can we just uh, go on to the other orbit that they wanted? That uh, magenta one. Well, I try and plot it, and it only takes about 170 odd meters per second. A little bit of tweaking. Don't know how close they really need it. This is, well, actually 190 odd meters per second there. Um, yeah, I, I don't know if the people count this as cheating because, you know, they, they wanted the satellite there. They probably wanted it to stay there. But along the way, I saw the warning message saying that oxygen, water, and food were running out in this pod because I had totally forgotten about Valentina. If you recall the EVA issues that we were having, I forgot to sort of resolve that. In fact, I still don't have a solution for that because it's sort of hard to test when it happens randomly, right? Uh, have you actually solved the problem when the EVA works? Uh, how do you know? Because uh, on when it happened, we were able to EVA just fine a few times, and it only had a problem after a few times, right? Anyway, so I'm just straight up deorbiting Valentina here. You notice that the shroud around the heat shield was sort of displaced in a weird way. I don't know what's up with that. Another uh, instance of glitching. But we get rid of the surface module a little bit later than I should have. I should have gotten rid of it outside the atmosphere. We're, we're already in the atmosphere. I think I was probably chatting away with uh, uh, during the live stream and uh, didn't pay too much attention. But anyway, at least it got away well. I mean, it didn't collide back with us or anything. So here we go, going through the thicker part of the atmosphere, slowing down. And ablator is ablating steadily. And eventually it all calms down by the time we get below 30 kilometers. We are below 1,500 meters per second now. And it looks good for Valentina's recovery, despite all the glitchiness during her mission. Parachute deployed. And still some food, water, and oxygen. Thank goodness for the warnings TAC Life Support gives us. Uh, really makes it much easier to uh, get things done and make sure that oh, there's some issues with the sky there let's just hide that and make sure that our kerbals don't get into trouble okay so uh, a little bit of science but most importantly Valentina comes back with a bunch of ribbons so back to our satellite contract we do the plotted burn to shift orbits from the first contract one to the second one and again yeah I mean I don't know if this is considered cheaty or not but Hey, uh, they didn't care whether we kept it in the first orbit, so they should just uh, make sure that when they make a contract with us like that, it actually stipulates that it has to stay in that orbit for a certain amount of time. Then, then we would do that. But anyway, uh, is this good enough for the second contract? Yes, it is. Uh, pretty, pretty far off, really, by my standards, but. If they'll take it, they take it. You can see, oh, uh, the pod, you might have noticed its electric charge had totally drained for Valentina. And uh, it was a good thing I had uh, preset the parachute to deploy because dang it took out a battery. And you could see that message there, a battery short circuited. Um, it would have had electric charge if not for that short circuit. But here I'm picking up the Luna 1 contract, which is a lunar flyby mission. So we're going to try and go flyby near IOTA. But not capture into orbit, the contract specifies that it has to be shot out into interplanetary space. So here we go, and four boosters on this one. A 
how it goes. But getting to IOTA is easier than getting those uh, satellite contracts done because we don't have to circularize or anything. And since we're not getting into orbit around IOTA. Okay, booster's off. Very good. This blue rocket is uh, doing well. And the end of that burn. Second stage. About the same sort of velocities as we saw in the previous launch. Yep, and here we go at the end of this stage, getting to about 4,000, close to 4,200. And an awkward pause as maybe I was talking or something. Separation and ignition. Okay, a little bit more time to apoapsis than last time. So we end up with a little bit more of a lopsided orbit. And all is well, we can now transfer out. The thing about applying the transfer is we do have some inclination with respect to IOTA. And that's because we our launch location is not equatorial, but IOTA is. So we have some inclination. And so I wanted to hit it at one of the nodes. But I also wanted IOTA to shoot us out into interplanetary space. But that combination of things just wasn't working out here. It just kept us into or in orbit around Gale. So I decided to just go with it and uh, we would uh, do another burn at IOTA in order to eject us. So not, not really how Luna 1 was done, uh, but actually with Luna 1 they were trying to smack into the moon anyway, so it really doesn't matter. Uh, here we go on our way and of course with solar panels we don't have to worry about losing electric charge. We do get to do some additional science high over IOTA, so I do that here. And, yep, just uh, the normal temperature scan and barometer scan. And here's our approach to IOTA, which is actually smaller than the uh, outer moon, which is SETI. SETI is actually larger than IOTA. So it's the reverse of the Kerman system situation. Okay, here we go. While we still have communication and line of sight, we should do our science. So transmitting that back. Successful science in space around IOTA during our flyby. And you can see I've already plotted our ejection. Basically, I wanted to use all of our remaining fuel to eject out into interplanetary space. Uh, for unknown reasons, I forget why, I stopped short of using all of the fuel. I could just kept it running. But anyway, off we go, away from IOTA now. And you can see the negative apoapsis down there. Well, we're still in IOTA sphere of influence, but eventually we will be ejecting out of Gale sphere influence. And actually, the contract is already read complete, even though we haven't gone out yet. As long as we have the ejection trajectory, it's satisfied with that. Uh, you can see an odd trajectory altogether, all uh, sort of a check mark, reverse check mark sort of thing. The question is whether we can maintain communication, and it turns out the answer is no. We lose communication uh, before we can actually uh, send the uh, science from interplanetary space. So, as a suggestion from a viewer, I decided to upgrade the tracking station. Uh, it costs a bit of uh, funding, but of course, uh, we just got some funds from completing all those contracts. And so now we barely have the ability. Uh, to communicate in interplanetary space and so I do the science. You can see in Kerbal Alarm Clock I have an alarm for a transfer window to Niven coming up and Niven is the planet uh, on the inside of Gale's orbit that's closest. Uh, so sort of like in the Venus sort of position I guess. So I aim to unlock better antennae in order to communicate with a probe to Niven because we've only got two days before that transfer window, and we have enough science now. So that high gain antenna I'm hoping with the tracking station upgrade will help us to communicate with an interplanetary probe, our first interplanetary probe. And uh, here we go preparing said probe with uh, two of the high gain antennae. But I'm not entirely sure they're good enough. Remember, I've scaled up the system by 6.4x, but the antenna haven't really gone along with that. Uh, so that is a uh, question mark in this whole situation. You can see I thought about replacing the SRBs with liquid boosters there, also a suggestion from a viewer, and I decided against it because it wasn't giving me the performance I wanted, I think mainly thrust to weight ratio. 
but actually these SRBs are pretty efficient, though they don't give me much value on recovery. Actually, the SRBs themselves don't give any value on recovery. We're basically recovering the decoupler parachute and anything else we slap onto them. So that's the downside of them, but uh, they, they, do, uh, they do a good job. And so we separate. And uh, always when there's a pause like that, I wonder if something horrible is about to happen. And here on with the LVT-45 completing its work. We're a little bit higher up than on previous flights. Carrying a somewhat heavier upper stage. The third stage is a bit heavier. You can see it's longer than previous flights. Okay, everything deployed there. Everything looks good. And we finish our orbit, just barely keeping in tight so that we can get some help with our transfer. And I do use MechJeb to try and uh, plan this particular transfer out because I've never transferred to Niven before. And so that's the plot it gives me. Not bad, uh, certainly doable. You can see uh, Delta V cost-wise only about 800 more than uh, that, that transfer to that satellite contract orbit and only a few hundred more than transferring to IOTA. So, just clearing up all the contract and world's first milestone messages, you can see we've accomplished a lot during this episode. And there is our transfer working out. You can see Niven perturbing our orbit, and uh, that is the approach. I'm tweaking with some uh, careful bursts, or not so careful bursts, from our engine. Okay, but the issue is communication. We've got those two high gain antennae. And as we depart the SOI of Gale, turns out they're not good enough. You can see no probe control there. Now we already have a plot for Niven, so it's already on its way. But we don't have any way of getting the science back home, unfortunately. So, alas, uh, we, we just left with this. And I'll have to figure out how to get better in tonight. Here's our entry into Niven SOI and we will get the messages saying that that we've gone into the SOI of Niven for the first time world first milestone and also escaped the gravitational influence of the Sun but uh, as we do our flyby and are unable to do the science I'll, I'll leave it here still a remarkable achievement we've done our first attempt at an interplanetary transfer so things are progressing well Alright, so on that note, thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did enjoy this video, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below. And I'll see you next time.